Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fourth in our Farming and the Environment Spring webinar series put on by the North Wessex Downs AWINB partnership. Today's subject is one very close to my heart, um, hedges, ever since I think about 25 years ago when I found myself sleeping in a very cold converted church on top of the hills somewhere near Blackburn learning how to lay hedges. It's been one of my favourite pastimes and I'm delighted that today we're joined by a really eminent expert in the field, Dr Rob Walton, who's been closely involved with hedges for over 30 years. Um, Rob formerly worked for Natural England and its predecessor bodies in part as a hedgerow specialist. He now works as an ecological consultant and helps to manage the family farm in Devon, which has many miles of hedges. Since its start, he's been closely involved with Hedgelink, the national body which brings organisations and individuals interested in hedgerows together, including serving as chairman. Rob is also currently chairman of the Devon Hedge Group and has recently co-authored a joint report published by Natural England defining favourable conservation status, status for hedgerows in England. You're very welcome, Rob. We're very much looking forward to your talk. Just before I hand over a little bit of housekeeping, um, for everyone um, listening, you should be able to see a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we welcome questions. We hope we'll have time for a number of questions for Rob after his talk. So if you have a question, feel free to type it in under the Q&A at any time during the webinar. The chat function is disabled. Um, after the webinar, we will be asking you to fill in a feedback form as you log off. And I please ask you to fill in that because it helps us to get a feel for what you need, how you, how you feel about the event and how we can improve for future events. And you'll also be emailed um, following the event a link to a recording of the webinar. So over to you, Rob. Thank you very much, Henry. Thank you for that introduction. And hello, everybody. It's very good to be speaking with you all about hedges because I, like Henry, am a great hetero enthusiast, and I hope that comes across during this talk. Um, I've just taken the opportunity over the last few minutes to wander down one of our hedgerows, and there are primroses and flowers, and the first blackthorn are just starting to come through, this pussy willow, and it really does lift my spirits to see the hedgerows like that. Although I have to say, Henry, that when I was laying one of my hedges alongside a particularly wet field, this um, this winter, it wasn't quite so much uh, fun slogging backwards and forwards through the mud with the brash. But still, I, I know when I look at that laid hedge later on in the year, it'll bring me pleasure. I'm very pleased to be speaking today because I do think hedges have great uh, and often untapped potential in terms of their value to farm businesses and to society as a whole. They do tend to be, I feel, unrecognised in that respect still. Um, Anna, you're changing the slides for me. If I could have the, the next slide, please, after this one. Thank you. Um, thank you. They are too often, I think, hedges seen as, uh, as something that's a, a cost uh, almost a burden on farms, whereas they should, I believe, really be seen as an asset. And I hope by the end of this talk, I can convince you of that if you don't already believe it. As Henry has said, there should be plenty of time at the end for a discussion, for questions. And I look forward to receiving your questions and comments and hearing to what you have to say. So this sentence here you may see on the screen in front of you at the moment actually encapsulates what I'm talking about. First of all, to use the parlance of the day, that hedgerows are hugely rich in natural capital. Um, as I said, that they can be of real benefit to farm businesses. And also that in terms of societies at large, they provide many public goods. Again, jargon of the day, but I'm sure you know what I mean about. And furthermore, goods for which increasingly the public at large are willing to pay. 
Next slide, please. But before going on to talk about the future hedgerow roles, it, I think it might be helpful for us to look back to past hedgerow uses. And really, I think these come into three categories, marking ownership boundaries, but that's redundant now, isn't it? Because we have very good maps and GPS and so forth. They were highly valued as stockproof barriers for keeping stock in and out of fields. But in truth nowadays, you know, we have wire fences, barbed wire, pig netting and so forth. And that function again is largely, well no, not entirely, but largely redundant. And then there's firewood. In the past, hedges were very valuable, very, very highly valued as a source of uh, fuel for the kitchen and to heat the home. And that's largely fallen out of practice these days, but it's starting to come back in. And it's something I'm going to come back to later on in this presentation. Next slide, please. So this is what I'm going to be talking about, uh, the current and future uses. And I'm going to go through each of these different um, subjects during, the, during this talk, um, which are a mixture of ways in which hedges are a benefit to farm businesses and a benefit to society, and sometimes to both. So I'm going to start off with biodiversity. Next slide, please. And um, with some pictures here of a yellow hammer and a bumblebee. Uh, of course, lots of queen bumblebees out and about at the moment, searching hedgerows for nesting sites. Uh, but there's lots of research and lots of evidence, and I'm sure it'll come no surprise to you that hedges are vital for the survival of much wildlife, particularly in intensive farmland situations. And although typically hedges only occupy, you know, a few percentage of the area of a farm, their value for conservation is out of all proportion in that. Next slide. And indeed, the amount of wildlife or biodiversity that they can support is quite astounding. Um, we've lost the slide just at the moment, but I was challenged by a, um, by a friend uh, about a decade ago now to just see how many different types of plant and animal and fungi I could find in a single hedge on our farm down here in Devon. And so I, I started to look and over the next two years in this single hedge, which isn't an exceptional hedge uh, for this part of the world, it's just a typical hedge. I was able to find, and I had a lot of help from experts in identification here, but over 2000, 2070 precise, different species of plant, animal and fungi, all of which are big enough to see with the naked eye incredible, astounding diversity. Of course, we are so large that we often miss all this happening altogether. And it's only if you've got good traps, and this is a malaise trap shown on the, the slide here, that you can find all these things. If we were the size of an ant, the world would be a very different place and suddenly it would become much, much more obviously species rich. 2,000 species, I think the truer total is probably near 3,000 species because there's a whole load of things, particularly parasitic wasps, which nobody could identify for me. But then there's 2,001 hedge, just think how many species there might be in a whole network of hedges. Who knows? Next slide, please. So if we didn't have hedges, there's no doubt about it at all that over large tracts of particularly intensively farmed countryside, we would lose a lot of species. And one example here is the brown hair street butterfly, which is an elusive species, but lays its eggs only on the new growth of blackthorn in nice sunny positions. And where better to find such growth than in hedgerows? And indeed, this is very much a hedgerow butterfly. And it is threatened now. And one reason why that is so is because 
um, hard annual trimming of hedgerows um, destroys the eggs and so the butterfly disappears. Next slide. There are quite large numbers of recognised threatened or rare species associated with hedgerows. Indeed, in terms of the NERC Act, there's 107, sorry, 107 priority species That's for those in the know, Section 41 species associated with hedgerows, significantly associated with them. And I'm not going to run through all of those, you'll be pleased to hear, but I'm just going to pick out a few of them. The first would be the turtle dove. I'm sure you've still got some within the AOMB, um, but like everywhere now, they're becoming very, very scarce. But this is a species that is associated quite closely with hedgerows. It likes big, thick, thorny hawthorn hedges in which to nest and from which to sing. Next slide. But something, a bird which I know you have good populations of still, and you're fortunate to have them, in the AOMB is the tree sparrow, which is also associated quite closely with hedges. It's a hole nester and will use hedgerow trees as nesting sites, but it also never likes to forage in fields far away from hedgerows. As soon as a sparrowhawk comes along, um, it's flying out of the fields for safety into your hedgerow. Next slide. And the hedgehog. Sadly, this too is on the threatened list now, um, and I'm not going to say much about it because the name really, hedgehog, says it all. Next slide. Bats. All, what is it, 17 species of British bat are associated with hedges in one way or another. Uh, the greater horseshoe bat is an endangered species, and you do have a colony within the AOMB. This is a species that um, a lot of radar tracking has been done on, and it's shown that it's actually flying along hedgerows, uh, both to catch its prey, which tends to be the larger dung beetles and moths and crane flies, um, but also, really importantly so, as safe conduits or highways through the countryside. So it's using these hedges as navigational aids and safe routes, um, as many other animals do, to move through the countryside. Next slide. And then my favourite, the dormouse. Extraordinarily fortunate here on our farm to have a healthy population of these wonderful animals. And this is one I photographed last year. And they're, they're nesting in our hedgerows because this is a species not of high forest, not of mature woodland. It's a species of dense thickets and secondary woodland of early to mid say successional coppice. It wants that dense growth and where better to find it other than in a good hedgerow network. And indeed, you know, hedgerows support healthy populations or can support healthy populations of dormice on their own right, as well as joining up other good patches of dormouse habitat. Next slide. Thank you, Anna. So here, um, that's all I'm going to say about special species associated with hedgerows, because I could talk forever about that. And likewise, I could talk for an awful long time to you about how to best to manage hedgerows for wildlife. Um, it's, it's a big topic and there's a lot of advice out there. But so I thought I would just pick out what I think are the five key elements about how to keep a hedge in a healthy condition for wildlife. So I'm gonna run through those quickly. First of all, hedges must be taken through this management cycle because you can't keep any hedge in one condition forever because the trees and shrubs are trying to mature. This, the cycle is that you start the cycle by planting a hedge or by freshly laying or coppicing it. Then you let it grow up, but as you do so, you're going to want nearly always to trim it on occasion to keep it thick and bushy, because that's a condition a lot of wildlife likes. But inevitably, over time, it's going to start to develop gaps along its length or at its base. And that is the time to let it grow up 
to the stage where it's ready for laying or coppicing again. And so the cycle is complete. So taking the hedges through that cycle is really, really important. The next point I'd like to make is that a hedge is not just a line of trees and shrubs. It's also any bank that goes with it, um, the mature trees, uh, any ditch, and of course, any immediate margins. And if you have flower rich or tussocky grass margins, they contribute enormously to the wildlife of a hedge. And when you manage the hedge, you should be thinking just as much about management of those margins as about the trees and shrubs themselves. Third point is about hedgerow trees. Lots of very good research that shows here that where you have hedgerow trees, I've talked here about you know, standard trees with clear canopies, that where you have those in hedgerow systems, they increase the amount of wildlife considerably for a variety of different reasons. So please do look after hedgerow trees and encourage new ones. And then fourthly, about structural diversity. No, there's no one perfect stage for hedge to be in. What you want across a farm or across a landscape is hedges in all sorts of different stages in that life cycle, that management cycle, including some that are developed into lines of trees. So please do think about hedges, not just as individuals, but in terms of the whole network. And then the fifth point is the one about connectivity. Um, don't want hedges just ending in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of fields. It's so much better for obvious reasons if they join up with other hedges or with other semi-natural habitats. Next slide, please, Anna. <clears throat> So that was a very brief run through, um, very, very brief run through of some of the management considerations when you're managing for wildlife. I now want to come on to some of the ways in which hedges are of direct benefits to farmers. And the first I talked about is crop pollination. Uh, lots of very good research on this too, which shows that in intensively farmed landscapes, hedges are absolutely vital for the maintenance of good populations of pollinators. Um, <clears throat> without the hedges, basically the bees and uh, bumblebees, uh, hoverflies and other pollinators, well, they've got nowhere to, to go basically when the crop is not in flower. The research here shows based on bumblebees that in fact, uh, crop set can be increased within 750 meters, so quite a considerable distance away from the hedge. Next slide. <clears throat> and if you have an orchard, you may have found the hedges are particularly valuable here. This is Monsieur Le Jean in uh, Normandy in France. And he's as proud as punch of his wonderful old traditional orchard, but was extolling to us the virtue of the hedges around his orchard because the apples and pears are depending upon uh, the bees and bumblebees to actually fertilize the flowers. But when the trees are not in flower, where are these insects getting their pollen and nectar from? Well, largely from the hedges, from the flowering trees and shrubs in the spring and from the herbs in the margins in the summer. Also, where are these bumblebees, where are they breeding? Where are their breeding nests? Of course, largely in the base of the hedges. And where do they hibernate? Again, in the hedges. So Monsieur Le Jean was looking after his hedges. And I have to say his uh, cider and particularly his cowdos was quite magnificent. Next slide. In terms of pest control, here too hedges have a real role to play for farmers. And it's not just hedges, but any other linear features. I mean, you will all have know, I'm sure, about beetle banks, for example, but about how here the predators of your crop pests, predators like carabid beetles, ladybirds, spiders, hoverflies, you know, they are surviving the winter 
in these hedges and the populations start to build up in the hedges in the spring and then these insects move out into the field um, where they help to control pests and can be effective in doing this over distances of at least 60 meters. Uh, and there's been some research which has shown, although not nearly enough research has been done on this, to actually show this is actually cost effective. So the savings in the amount of pesticides that has to be used um, are greater than the costs of actually maintaining or managing the hedgerow. Next slide. Thank you. And hedges even have a role to play in terms of reduction of uh, diseases. So this is some really good proper research done by Oxford University on landscapes and the impact of hedges on herd breakdowns of bovine tuberculosis. And they found that where you've got good hedgerow networks, then contagion and breakdowns are decreased. And in fact, quite significantly so. So an increase of just one kilometer per 100 hectares decreased the risk of breakdowns by 12 and a half percent. So a significant amount. So this was good research and fully controlled for. Next slide. Um, just to touch here upon field sports, and I'm sure many of you will be aware of the importance of hedges as cover and breeding sites for quarry species like pheasants and partridges, and how the hedges can facilitate rough shooting, particularly helping the birds to rise for the guns. Next slide. So those were some benefits for um, specifically for farm businesses. And I'm gonna provide a few more a bit later on, but now I want to turn to some benefits of hedges to wider society. Uh, these days, you know, we're all talking about climate change. And one of the impacts we know of climate change is heavier and more frequent rainfall events. And that floods are becoming more and more frequent. Well, here hedges have a real role to play in reducing the, the, the frequency and severity of flood events. Next slide. What the hedges are doing is basically, when you've got a, a storm event, is they're reducing the rate at which the water runs off the fields into the streams and thence into the rivers. And they do that by acting as a physical barrier to the water and sediment movement, just simply blocking it from going down the slope. But they also do it by um, increasing the rate at which water penetrates or infiltrates into the ground they can be very effective in this role. Some work done in Wales has shown that hedges adjacent to sheep pastures, which where the soils were compacted, um, that actually the water was able to infiltrate 60 times faster or 65, 60 times greater amounts into the soil beneath trees and beneath hedges than in the open fields. And then finally, hedges also reduce the rate at which water runs off fields because during the summer, a deficit in soil moisture tends to build up next to the hedge and it simply becomes longer during the winter for this to become saturated. Next slide. If you're interested or being encouraged to um, create new hedges or to manage hedges for, to reduce flood risk, then these are some pointers here. First of all, clearly your hedges need to be along, along contours or along the edges of watercourses. If they have earth banks, so much the better, just because there are better physical barriers. But remember they don't, the idea here is not to create uh, dams. Um, you don't want ponds forming behind these hedges. And you may be able to pick out if you've got sharp eyes that the red arrow is actually picking out a drainage pipe going through the bank here. The idea is that the bank will slow the rate at which the water moves down slope. You don't want 
gaps in your hedge network because clearly the water will just find those gaps and flow through it rapidly. And likewise, you don't want there to be open ditches or other ways in which head, the water can find its rapid way down to the watercourses. The purpose of these hedges is to reduce the rate at which the water runs off the fields. Next slide. Uh, this I found an enormously impressive example of how just effective hedges are at preventing the loss of soil from fields. This is a, a sediment trap placed across the bottom of a field. Not quite sure what the crop is. I'm sure someone online could tell me. Um, but this was the amount of sediment captured after just one rainfall event. And that soil would otherwise have been lost to the watercourses and eventually out to sea. And it is true to say that hedges actually transform landscapes over time. Next slide. When you get your eye in for this, it comes quite apparent. Here we have a hedge which has been coppiced, so you can see the effect easily. But basically the hedge has caught soil behind it, upslope, and kept that on the land. And so you end up with a terrace. And I've seen these terraces all over the country. And, you know, work has shown that they, hedges do prevent an awful lot of soil from being lost from the land. Next slide. And so we talked about hedges reducing flood risk, about the conserving soil, but the third element in that same general theme is that they're also very effective in removing diffuse pollution. So here research, and there's been lots of it, shown that when they're well sited and well managed, well established hedges can remove nearly all the nitrogen and phosphorus from water running off fields and indeed nearly all, up to 90% of the herbicides. Next slide. And they do this in the same way as mechanisms we've already talked about. So they're increasing the infiltration of the surface water into the ground, particularly effective where the soils are compacted. They're just simply a barrier to sediment and water movement, but they're also a sink for nutrient uptake. So many of these fertilizers, of course, are taken up into the woody mass and foliage of the hedges, and so they don't reach the watercourses. Next slide. And this is a hot topic, isn't it? Carbon storage and capture in these days of talking about climate change. Uh, Hedges have a big role to play here, and we will, I'm sure, be finding them to be considered to be increasingly important in this respect. So it become no surprise to you that hedges store more carbon than the cropped ground or grazing land next to them. But do remember, please, that that carbon is stored not just in the above ground growth, but also in below ground woody growth, the roots and so forth, and importantly, in the soil itself, where it tends to be locked up in an inert form for a very long period of time. Next slide. And it's a view recognition of the role that hedges can play in um, helping to capture carbon out of the atmosphere. The, the Climate Change Committee in their recent report um, recommended an increase in the extent of British hedges of 40% to help the country meet its net zero targets by 2050. And I'm very pleased to say that the NFU has also um, taken this up. Their target of course for net zero is 2040. Um, but they too recognize that hedges have a real role to play in achieving that quite ambitious target. But they are a quick win, win in that respect it's going to be quite easy in comparison to other methods to either plant new hedges or to let existing hedges get wider. Next slide. And just an indication of how much carbon can be stored in a well hedged landscape. Research in Brittany 
shows that 13% of all the carbon in such a landscape is stored in the hedges. So a significant amount. Next slide. So if you, and I'm sure increasingly, we are all going to be asked to manage our hedgerows for carbon. And that brings some interesting challenges. But here are some pointers about what we should be thinking about. The first of all is about planting new hedges. And we should be thinking, I think, very much here in terms of agroforestry, something I'm going to come back to later on in this talk. And we might consider planting hedges as part of the alley cropping systems. The Climate Change Committee target was to increase the extent of hedges by 40%. So that doesn't just mean making more hedges, but it also means making them wider. And that's something I think that can relatively easily be done a lot of farming systems. But do remember, please, that because so much of the carbon is stored in the soil, that actually just having good wide margins to your hedges will also help a lot. And the third point is about the importance of retaining existing mature hedgerow trees, simply because they contain a lot of biomass and encouraging new ones. And the next slide. And so while talking about biomass and climate change, um, opportunity here to now think about hedgerows in terms of uh, green energy and the fact that they can be managed and cropped to produce wood fuel. Uh, wood fuel. And good research done on this, including by the Organic Research Centre at their previous research station at Elm Farm, which is either in or on the edge of the AOMB, has shown that this, uh, the hedgerows can actually manage to produce wood fuel cheaply and cost effectively. I'm going to say a little bit more about that. Um, but at the same time, you can actually improve the health of your hedge for biodiversity or whatever. And of course, your hedge then clearly is no longer just a liability or a cost to the farm. It really does become an asset. Next slide. So hedges can be managed in this way to either produce wood chips or logs. The advantage of wood chips is that you can use the whole of the hedge, but also that you can do it entirely from the excavator or tractor cab. So the hedges can be uh, coppiced using excavator mounted tree shears, and then the whole trees can be fed into a big tripper the chips blown into a wagon and then emptied into a heap in a, a covered shed where they will self dry, no need to turn, self dry within three or four months and be ready for using directly in a wood chip boiler. Logs on the other hand um, tend to be very much more demanding in terms of muscle power and sweat, although if you have a good wood presser, that processor that would help. But of course, for a lot of domestic um, premises, log boilers are, or log stoves are practical, whereas wood chip stoves are not. Now, I have at the end of this presentation, um, in case it is placed up online, a short case history of a farmer down in Dorset who is who not only farms, but also has a log business. And that is based to a considerable degree on logs that are harvested from his hedgerows and those of his neighbors. And he makes a financial go of doing that. We can come on to that if we have time at the end, and if you wish to. Next slide. Now just to show you how cost-effective managing hedges for wood chips can be, uh, this bar chart here compares the price per energy unit kilowatt hour of different sources of energy. And you see right on the left hand side, the short blue bar is hedge wood chips. Now I would stress that this, this is wood chips that are produced on farm for on farm use. But you can see that that bar is shorter than any of the others. So it's more cost effective to manage your hedges 
uh, for wood chips, if you want to heat your house or your livestock units, than it is to buy in, say, the fossil fuels of oil or gas. Hedge logs, on the other hand, um, are about on par with buying in oil. The point really here is that it really is practical and economic and effective to manage hedges to produce a wood fuel crop. Next slide. So moving on, but still on the theme basically of climate and helping um, our farms to adapt to a changing climate, hedges have a role to play and will have an increasing role to play in providing shelter and shade. So think first thing first of all in terms of livestock, um, you know, it's traditionally, and you will all be aware of how important hedges can be for the survival of lambs in the late winter or spring, but they're also important for cattle. Cattle are more prone to heat stress than they are to cold stress. We've all seen cattle on a hot summer's day and uh, lying in the shade of a hedgerow tree and apparently enjoying that. And indeed, the research shows that where the cattle have shade, then their growth rates increase, milk, milk yield increases, and disease resistance and fertility also improve. So hedges will have an increasing value, I think, in a time when we're having more and more summer heat waves, particularly for cattle. Next slide. But they also have a value in terms of providing shelter for crops. We are living in an increasingly stormy um, world with a lot of uh, strong winds happening. And hedges here can be really effective. And they do it by, of course, reducing water strength because of, as the wind speed lessens, lessens, so water stress is reduced. Uh, there's less uh, evaporation and evapotranspiration, but also reduces crop lodging. Um, you don't have so much soil blowing off the land and daytime temperatures can be reduced. And if you were, of course, if you were near the coast, then you wouldn't suffer so much from the damaging effects of salt spray. I know that doesn't occur, that doesn't affect the AOMB. So here, shelter from hedges and basically the shelters in this, the hedges in this respect are windbreaks. Um, they can improve crop yields significantly, particularly so for horticulture and for fruit, but also for broadleaf crops like potatoes, sugar beet and beans. And yields have been found to increase by up to 25% for cereals and up to 75% for vegetables. Of course, that will depend considerably upon the location, on the degree of exposure, and on the soils. Uh, and incidentally, hedges can significantly reduce wind speed over 12 times their height. So if you have a hedge that's say six or seven meters high, then the wind speed will be significantly reduced over a hundred meter width of field. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Changing tack a little bit now, um, hedges to some other ways in which hedges can be useful to farms and society. If you'll see that, and some of you may well do this, that if you're direct selling produce from the farm, it's often done on the back of attractive landscapes, including ones that have good hedgerow networks they are considered by the public, by the consumer, to be desirable functions. And so that may help to increase the marketability and profitability of your produce. Also, when farms come up for sale, unless they are in demand by other commercial, highly commercial units, then the hedgerows often increase the value of the farm if it's to pass into the hands of wealthy people coming out of the cities. Next slide. And we mustn't forget that hedges too have enormous cultural and historical value. 
Uh, it's difficult to put a pound sign by this, I know, but we should not forget about it. It's all part of their natural capital. Um, so a great many of our hedges are ancient. Um, two thirds of the English landscape is ancient and that's reflected in the hedges present. And you can tell an awful lot about the history of a landscape by looking at its hedgerow patterns. Lots of local folklore associated with hedgerows. And of course, there are all these wonderful different traditional hedge laying styles associated with hedges. So here we have the Midlands Bullock style, very effective, um, effectively creating a, a stop proof fence or barrier that lasts for a long time. And certainly I've seen this within your AOMB. And it's important, I feel really important that we should continue to maintain these sort of hedges. Right, I must move on. Next slide, please. Recreation. Um, in terms of diversification, hedge, the presence of hedges may well increase the opportunities you have for bed and breakfast, for dog walkers, etc. And next slide. And then again, a lot of talk these days about health and well-being. And we all know that nature is an effective stress reducer, being particularly apparent during this pandemic. And if farmers wish to engage with their local communities and provide opportunities for local people to appreciate and enjoy their hedges, maybe pick a blackberry or two, that's all to the good. But also, um, as we see here in this rather bizarre photograph taken from Holland, um, it people can engage with hedgerows as a sort of type of green gym, if you like, and get a lot of physical activity and community engagement by doing so. Next slide. <clears throat> so I'm drawing to, <coughs> excuse me, I'm drawing towards the end of my talk now, but I would urge you please to think of hedges as a sort of agroforestry. Um, we don't, tend to do this in this country, although across the channel on, on continental Europe and in North America, hedges are definitely thought of in those terms and hence thought of as a valuable part of the, biz of the farm business and that they should be managed in ways that actually benefit the farm. And indeed, you know, hedges should, uh, for the reasons that I've already given, they should improve farm profitability. And the point I'm making at the bottom of this slide here is that not only can they sustain and sometimes improve crop yields, they can also provide um, income through, uh, if managed as wood fuel, but also they are attractive for, they can attract public support payments. The next slide. So, you know, when we think about environmental stewardship and countryside stewardship, often the easiest way to draw down those payments has been through hedges and the hedgerow options have been really popular in that respect. And there have been, there is many a farm that has benefited hugely in that way from having hedgerows. And the rates of payment are often quite generous. And there are, payments under countryside stewardship for cutting on a two or three year rotation. Yet the research done by Silso College has shown that usually, not always, but usually farmers can actually save money by cutting on a two, year two or three year rotation. Yet they, yet they get paid under countryside stewardship, which is all fantastic. I'm not complaining about that. In the least I benefited from it myself. And what we can be sure of is moving forward that as the basic payment scheme is, um, is phased out and the environmental land management scheme comes in, the hedges will feature prominently within that new form of support. And we've recently just had announcements regarding one of the environmental land management schemes that's proposed, and that is the Sustainable Farming in Initiative. Uh, next slide, please. 
Now, I would hasten to say here that I have no particular insight into the sustainable farming incentive. Um, I probably know no more about it than you do. So I've, which is what I picked up from the farmer announcements um, last week or just over a week ago. They are piloting the sustainable farm incentive or intend to start piloting it soon and inviting farmers to partake in this. And here's what they say for the hedgerow standard. And by standard, I think we can say this is a set of actions which they're asking people to do. And I'll just read through this in a moment, the black box there. And it says, we should manage your hedgerows to provide year round food, shelter, and breeding cover for birds and insects. So the hedgerows will strengthen landscape character, maintain and improve habitat connectivity, increase resilience to climate change, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, contribute to improving local air quality, and reduce soil erosion. Now I've covered all those briefly during this talk, apart from the air quality one, which I think is possibly the least important. Although hedges in the vicinity of intensive livestock production units can certainly help to re reduce the effects of ammonia emissions. And then we see in the blue gray box on the right hand side, that there is proposal with three different levels, with different levels of a payment, depending largely on how frequently you cut your hedges or uh, how much of your hedge you left uncut so you get good flower and berry crops on it, um, how many hedgerow trees you leave and whether or not you provide buffers or margins. So I've given a link there um, at the bottom where you can find out more information about this. But the real point I'd like to make here is that hedges will doubtless be an important element for taking forward farm incomes, particularly on those farms where the basic payment scheme has been really important in the past. Next slide, please. So uh, this just brings me my conclusion. The main points I, I would like you to take away from this talk is that hedges can benefit farm businesses in many ways. And those include conserving soil, sustaining or increasing yields through shelter, pest control, pollination, improving animal welfare, facilitating diversification in the ways I've talked about, uh, demonstrating social responsibility. That's important, in particular in building links between farmers and their local communities. Attracting support payments, just talked about that. And then finally, you can actually manage hedges to produce cost-effective crops of wood fuel. Next slide. So that, that brings my talk to a conclusion. Thank you very much indeed for listening. So very pleased to take your questions now. Uh, there is, if you receive this presentation later, there are one or two slides to follow, which gives some links to further information and also to the short wood fuel case history I talked about. Thank you, Henry. Thank you very much, Rob. That was fascinating. Um, and also I think a very beautiful presentation. Um, I should explain that Rob is um, speaking to us, I think, from deepest, darkest Devonshire um, with a slightly wobbly <laughs> link. So apologies if anyone missed the odd word here and there, but I think we got everything. We've got some really cracking questions. So I'm going to ask my colleague Corinna Woodall to come in and help us field them, Rob, in the time remaining. Corinna. Yeah, thank you so much, Rob. That was a really comprehensive presentation. Um, we have a question here from Peter Starr, who's, who asks, what maximum size of field would you recommend to be hedged? Uh, because whilst traveling in the United States of America in the southern states, he saw huge dust bowls because the Americans had ripped out hedging to make big fields and winds had blown away the topsoil. Um, I don't think I can answer that question perfectly but what I can say is that we probably think probably that an optimal hedgerow density and this will vary by landscapes and so it would not be appropriate for example for open chalk downlands but we're looking at about 
uh, 10 kilometers of hedge per square kilometer. If you can achieve that on average across our landscapes, then that will be probably best for wildlife and a lot of other things too. You're muted, Henry. Sorry, I was very glad that you um you referred to landscape character there, Rob, because of course it will vary. And the North Wessex Sands is an interesting landscape in that context because at one end we have a lot of ancient countryside with really historic hedges, um, and and at the other end, as you say, a lot of open downland. Uh, we have a question from Robert Fiddler, um, saying I have a very mature, thinly spaced, woody ash hedge. It has no base or bottom. What management is suggested to improve the cover and density? <laughs> now that, that's, a, that's a real problem, isn't it? With ash hedge for a start, it's probably suffering from ash dieback. And, um, or if it isn't, it will be soon. And so you will lose most of the ash plants. I think what I would consider doing at the moment is to coppice the hedge so a lot of the ash will probably die, but then and then plant up the gaps. And so more or less start again on that hedge, I think. Uh, don't, if there are any mature trees, ash trees, don't fell them now, unless they pose any particular risk, because after all, deadwood is hugely important for wildlife. And one of those ash trees might be one of the rare resistant individuals on which the future of ash depends upon in this country. But I think that's probably without seeing the hedge I'd recommend is to coppice and then plant up the gaps to get back to a good thick hedge. Okay. Um, and we've also got a question from Anne Munt, uh, who says in getting a hedge back into a management cycle, how should you decide where to lay and where to coppice? Uh, normally, um, you lay when the hedge is slightly younger. So when the stems are, I don't know, about when, when the hedge is, say, eight to 12 foot tall, um, the stems are three to four foot inches in diameter, that's about the right stage to lay a hedge. Um, bigger, then it comes right stage for coppicing. Now, if you want to manage the hedge for wood fuel, you probably want it to let get bigger so you get a bigger crop. So coppicing would be the right thing to do. However, if you're really interested in wildlife, then laying is better because you get more habitat continuity. Thank you, Rob. We also have one more question, which we're gonna try and squeeze in. And uh, we, Rob, we might have time for your case study if um, we can run over a couple of minutes. So this one is from Harold Macon saying, flails can leave a shredded hedge. Any tips to avoid this or any machine that works better than the flail? Ah, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, Flails, I'm all in favour of them. Uh, flail a proportion of the hedges and half every year, um, just simply because it's a really quick, efficient way of trimming a hedge. Um, other machines, for example, those with uh, rotary saw blades, uh, they go along, they do a very nice clean job of cutting the material. But on the other hand, you'll then lay a lot of branches that have fallen down to the ground, which then have to be raked up in some way and put into a heap and probably burnt. So I've no qualms at all about using a flail to trim hedges. I would just ask that it's done sympathetically. So don't cut back hard to the same point every year. Let the hedge, if you're gonna cut every year, then let the hedge grow up and out a little bit, just a few inches each year. And that brings a lot of benefits in terms of more flowers and more berries and more wildlife. Okay. Um, thank you, Rob. Um, we'd quite like to go to your case study if you're happy to, to okay. buy. Yeah, sure. Um, sure. Anna, are you able to? Key that up. 
Here we are. Thank you. So th this is just four slides, right? But it's it it, it tells you about uh, a farmer who's a good friend of mine um, from the West Dorset on the Devon border, who has a family farm. Um, there, which is a commercial farm, livestock and arable farm. But he is absolutely passionate about his hedges. And together with his son, Ewan, um, they run a, a business selling logs to the local community. And it's a successful business and it employs the, his son almost entirely. And Ross here was very keen to actually demonstrate just what could be achieved in terms of productivity and economically for managing one hedge on his farm. So he chose a hedge um, which is 220 meters long, um, which was mainly sycamore and ash. So the top end of hedges in terms of producing a good wood fuel cross, crop. And then what he did was to copy that hedge and see what he got out of it and how much money he could achieve. Next slide. Thank you. Um, and so what he did was he, what he found was that he could generate nine tons from this hedge of good quality firewood logs because he finds his customers don't like the um, what he terms as the ugly log. So these are the small twisted gnarled things. Um, but, but fortunately his family has about six wood stoves between them. And so he was able to use that material too. Uh, he was used to a branch logger to section up some of the stems into net bags. And those are the bags you can see there, the green bags to produce mini logs. And he produced 99 bags of that and sold that to glamping concerns nearby. Apparently they're very popular for that. And then he also used the branch logger to produce kindling. And although he by no means used the whole hedge for this purpose, he did produce 260 bags of kindling. So that's what came out of this 220 meters of hedge. And the next slide. Um, uh, and this was what he was really doing about, was it profitable? So he found that it cost him and his son, in, including all crossover labor's costs and all the overheads, 3,378 pounds to um, copies and produce all this firewood. The income was 400 pounds late, greater, 3,700 odd pounds. And then on top of that, he factored in um, his savings while not cutting the hedge every year, because normally he and his neighboring farmers do tend to cut their hedges every year, which is an expensive business, as I'm sure many of you will know. And his savings there on this hedge over the coppice cycle were 1,155 pounds. And so in his view, um, his profit on that hedge was one and a half thousand pounds. And that's without any support payments. So he's not in countryside stewardship or anything like that. And the next slide. And so his conclusions from this, and there you'll see him splitting logs, was that actually it was these coppicing hedges for wood fuel is enough to return uh, a living wage or alternatively to employ a contractor. And by doing so, and because this is something that really interests him, he can actually provide rural employment. He also has, and I've seen them, very good hedges on the farm. Um, so they're full of wildlife. And so that was pleasing to him as well. And then finally there, point six, was that he was able to save 8,500 litres of oil. So it really was a green, sustainable form of energy. And I think that's the last slide I had of that case study. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much, Rob. That was, that was really useful practical advice. I'm afraid we have run out of time. I know we've got one more question. I'm sorry that we haven't managed to come on to that, but Thank you very much, Rob, for a really excellent 
talk covering a whole wide range of aspects. I think we might have to run a whole series um, by you with different aspects of hedge management. Um, thank you to Anna Trant, who's been running this event for us behind the scenes, and Corinna Woodall, who you've just seen, who has put the whole thing together. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, you will receive, as I said at the beginning, an email with a link to the recording of the webinar. Um, and I just want to flag up to you again the feedback form. Um, there's just a few questions when you log off the webinar that you'll be asked. And if you can just take a moment to fill that in, please, we'd be very grateful because it will help us with our future events if we run them. The fifth and final one of these webinars is on the 15th of April, as you can see on the screen there. And uh, we will obviously um, welcome your booking of that. And if you look in the chat in the chat now, you will see a, a live link um, which you can click on if you'd rather. So thank you again all very much. Thank you very much to Dr. Rob Walton, our speaker, and goodbye.